governments try to understand. They come to Singapore to try to distill out what is this secret sauce. The first is what Professor Koh mentioned. How is it Singapore can spend less than 4% GDP and seemingly achieve very, very good outcomes? Right? And in this age of austerity, more and more people are coming to try to understand. This is, the second thing is, remember that Singapore was a former British colony and the British adopted the, the really National Health Service in 1948. We attained limited self-government in 1959. So we at least had over a decade of an NHS-type system. But how then did we evolve from a model where the government pays roughly two-thirds to three-quarters of the total healthcare bill to the current system that Wat Kai Hong chaired, where the government pays roughly a third. So in the course of one generation, we have managed to inverse the ratios where health is no longer a government's job, but it is the individual and the family's responsibility. And that, when really public finances are very stretched, governments are even more interested to know. So um, let's start. And what I would like to share with you is really a brief, a very a brief tour of the political philosophy that guides the evolution of the Singapore health system. And it's not because my host is a political scientist, but honestly, if you want to understand health, housing, education, study political science, understand the political philosophy, and almost like physics or like mathematics, once you understand, you can derive the rest from first principles. So maybe the first thing I want to share is that in the early days, even the health minister speaking at a, at a World Health Organization conference shared, in Singapore, we have no illusions as to where health stands. Right? And he made this point that at best, it's fifth. I'm glad I wasn't in the MOH in 1967. We have been quite demoralizing for your minister to say, guys, I love you all, but we're at best fifth. Right? So, and of course, Mr. Lee, speaking to senior civil servants in 1981, made his point very, very clear that subsidies on consumption are wrong and ruinous comparing it to opium or heroin. Very, very strong words. Um, and what really struck me was that he included health as consumption, but education and other activities that may generate economic benefit were considered to be investment. So um, it is very telling, and, hold, and really hold this thought because there's a body of really political science that has developed around this. And... Maybe this is a more recent quote, and I'm sure Minister Call will not blame me for this, but back in 2007, he rather famously said that it's very difficult. If we overestimate demand and oversupply, we end up with underutilized assets, a costly outcome. So between the two, I prefer to undersupply than to oversupply. Um, I think these are famous last words because the political philosophy has changed dramatically over the last two years. So... Um, if I ask you to think about it, what the political scientists call this is really productivist welfare capitalism, where social policy is subordinate to the overriding policy objective of economic growth. So you think about it, health, in a sense, is a necessary consumption. Right? If we do not provide enough health people, we won't have productive workers, people may riot in the streets and so on. So we need to provide enough health and we'll emphasize the health system on what enables us to have productive, economically useful workers, right? So, so really, and this was encapsulated in the white paper of 1993, which has continued to guide Singapore policymakers over the years. So one of the secrets as to how the government flipped the financing ratio was really to emphasize that the healthcare system needs to be structured to strengthen this sense of personal responsibility maximum incentive on, for the individual to stay healthy and avoid using more medical services than he absolutely needs. And that, in a sense, is the philosophical underpinning of MediSafe to encourage individuals, or, okay, maybe, and maybe encourage is too kind of word, to force individuals to save for their health and to force individuals to save for the health of their, of their family members. And of course, if I were a card-carrying opposition member, I would conveniently raise the point that it then means that the government becomes the funder of last resort. But I'm not. So, okay. And very early on, right, and here, this is one of Mr. Lee's very early insights, having been a law student uh, in the UK at the time of, of the National Health Service. 
And he was very clear in his mind that co-payments were essential for all the reasons that really Kai Hong raised. And the truth be told, there is very strong empiric data that the moral hazard is real. And there is a strong tendency to overconsume. Minister Kaur probably explains it the best by asking how many of you over ate at the buffet before this talk. And all the sheepish looks will basically tells you that the buffet syndrome or moral hazard is very, very real. So right from 1960, the brave new government introduced user charges or co-payments, 50 cents for weekdays, $1 for public holidays. So, so that's the political philosophy that has dominated Singapore healthcare for many years, productivist welfare capitalism. We have thou shall co-pay, that's the 11th commandment here in Singapore. Right? And this very deliberate tendency, this very deliberate policy to undersupply because to oversupply would be to have infrastructure that would be, would be sitting idle or it would be used simply because it was there. Right? And of course, when we talk about co-payments, the government's philosophy has always been that whatever the government puts out, the people have to put out also. So, and in the public forum sometime in 2008, um, Minister Kaur first uh, floated the balloon that, that healthcare spending would go up from 4% to as much as 7 to 9% GDP. But he qualified that if spending went up, the individual spending would also have to go up commensurately. Right? And of course, the last philosophy that, that had guided us all these years was a very utilitarian one, the greatest good for the greatest number. And here I see some of our friends from the media. Um, and here, uh, the Straits Times has waged a long and very painful battle to encourage the government to consider really including children born with congenital illnesses into MediShield. And this is very important for two reasons. Firstly, the, the children have acute medical needs that need to be paid for. Children born with hole in the heart, cleft lip, and, and with cleft pellets, and so on. And secondly, after the acute illness has been treated, many of them are uninsurable. They will not be able to get insurance subsequently, and this continues to burden them for the rest of their lives, and their, and their parents too. But the government has consistently refused because the studies show that premiums will have to go up if we do so. And this may render MediShield unaffordable to many. Right? So remember, the greatest good for the greatest number. So all, these, so all these principles guided policymakers for many, many years, and then the world changed. Right? Uh, but we'll just show some of the data. Um, and if you look at this chart, it really shows that we have spent very little compared to other countries, both in terms of total public spending national healthcare spending as a percentage of GDP, and of course, government spending also. Okay, but there are very good reasons for this. I don't have time. We'll go into it later in terms of the discussion. And this deliberate policy to undersupply because Roma's law, those of you who study health e economics, a bed built is a bed filled. Um, so we have deliberately tried to keep a cap on how much public healthcare infrastructure we want to develop. And this chart simply shows what are our number of beds, the acute beds and the extended care or the, or the long-term care beds versus the OECD average. And you can see that we are actually lagging pretty far behind, roughly half of what the OECD countries have. And, but I would qualify that all healthcare systems are very, very different. Having half the number of beds is not necessarily a bad thing. Right, but I put this chart up to really demonstrate what are the effects of the, of the guiding political philosophy over all these years. I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it's bad, it's just the way that Singapore has thought about healthcare. And pre-elections, Mr. Kaur, remember back in 2011, it was very topical to talk about hard truths. Every minister wanted to share their version of the hard truths. So these were the hard truths from the healthcare sector, but the world changed in, my, in, in 2011. Um, a lot of people started to attend opposition rallies and the politics got a little difficult. And so today we stand at the cusp of profound change in the healthcare system. What are some of these changes? Right? In, from December 28th last year, major review to keep healthcare affordable. And something that Minister Gan said, we have to look into how healthcare can be affordable from the perspective of the patient. 
which is actually pretty radical from a system point of view because as a government, we had always looked at how to keep, the, how to keep healthcare sustainable from the system point of view. Right? Um, we also did not start